So I ask you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at the first seven verses. God's word says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, and ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For he who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou did receive it, why do you glory as if thou hast not received it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for an opportunity once again to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ. Just to sing our praises, to, to hear from you, to offer our prayers. And Lord, you're always there. You, you inhabit the worship of your people. You long for it. Lord, I pray we are always, always faithful to you. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us tonight, that you would make application to my life and to our, our lives, our hearts. And Lord, that we would do something with it. We wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You know, we've been in this study of 1 Corinthians, and uh, you know, the reality is we're fixing to get into some pretty interesting uh, text. Uh, but I, I didn't want to pass over this. Now, you remember from our very first time in Corinthians that this is a letter written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul to a troubled church. Now, the, the, the not funny thing, I guess the sad thing is, many of the problems he addresses in, in the Corinthian church are still very much doing uh, alive and well in, in our day and age. But not only is this historically in a context, and, and this is to a specific church in a specific place at a specific time with these specific problems, there also can be great application to the problems that we face. Uh, maybe not exactly as they are facing, He's addressing those, but there's great truths that can still be gleaned from that. You know, if you, if you just look back, um, it, it's going to talk about, um, in the earlier chapter, sources of wisdom. Uh, you know, I love that he starts off by saying, I want you to know something. I've blessed you in every way. I've given you, and at your disposal is everything you need, Christian. Now, understand, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, I'm not talking to you. Or at least you don't have all these things of Christ at your disposal yet. But once you come to him, you do. And he tells them that in the very first chapter. And then he, he goes into the, about divisions in their church really early. And he mentions it again in chapter 3. But one of the major issues is divisions in the church. We're going to talk about tonight why they had those divisions. But then he also talks about sources of wisdom. Where are you going to get your truth? You've got a source. It may be your best friend. It may be, and I always got I laughed at, at my kids when they were little because I'd say, where did you hear that? I heard it from Johnny's big brother. 
who was probably 14 at the time, you know, in his, all his wisdom and wealth of, of life that he had. But she, you've got a source. What is your source going to be? Is it going to be this world? Is it going to be Google or the Internet? Or is it going to be God's Word? And I'll say this, uh, you can use Google to look up God's word sometimes. Be very careful because you'll get a hold of some sites that are, are very ungodly trying to make application to God's word. I'm just saying look at the source very, very cl- closely and carefully. So we've got to decide what's going to be our source of wisdom. And then he talked about there's immaturity in the church. I ought to be feeding you with meat. But you can't handle it. You choke. And so I've got to give you milk. And then he goes back into divisions of church. Some say I follow Paul. Some say I follow Apollos. Some say I follow Peter or Cephas. And then we come to chapter 4. And and I love those first two verses because he tells us really what the responsibilities of ministers are. He says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. More it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now let's get something clear too. He's not just talking about us preachers. He's talking about everyone who claims the name of Jesus. You are a minister in Christ. Now, I'm not denying or or, uh, lessening my call. God called me to do certain things. He called me to preach. He called me to teach. Absolutely. But he called many of you to do much of the same thing. Paul is teaching the Corinthians... How to think. You remember when we went with the Philippians? Many times he said, you need to change the way you're thinking. You see, they're at a point that they are thinking, I'm a follower of Paul. Or I'm a follower of Apollos or Cephas. And he's saying, you're getting it wrong. All they are are ministers of Christ. Who you ought to be following, who I ought to be following, is Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Now, I love the word. uh, In the Greek, the word used for minister there is under oarsman. Under oarsman. I didn't row a boat lately. (laughs) Neither have y'all. But everyone in Corinth would have understood what that word meant. Corinth Corinth was where war galleys of the Roman Empire crossed from the Ionian Sea over to the Aegean Sea. And they knew, the Corinthians knew, that the lowest deck of a war ship was made of single rows of benches on each side with rowers under oarsmen. Now listen, there was one other guy, he was the captain of the ship. Uh, he, he stood uh, raised above the other so each rower could see him. It was the rower's task to row according to what he said. If he wanted a ship to move, they were to row. If, and you've heard them. They go, row, row, get this cadence going so they would all be together. And, and it was his job to pilot the ship. If he wanted them to stop, they had to stop instantly. Their whole business was to obey his orders. That's what Paul's saying. We're not the captain. He's the captain. Your job, my job as under oarsmen is to keep our eyes upon him, our ears glued to him. I don't even know if that's a term. And do exactly what he says when he says to do it. Isn't that a picture Isn't that a great word picture, though? Under oarsman. Um, Let me get back to my other page now. So he says, minister, not just the preachers, certainly including the preachers and staff and all who know Christ, 
but they're called to minister in the name of Christ. Let me ask you a question, and you have heard our pastor say it a million times. No one can do everything. Something. Do you have a ministry? What is it? Maybe you're not a mouth like Brother Sam. (laughs) Maybe you don't have a voice like Brother Billy. I've told you how to cure that. But whatever it is, God's given you. Do you have a ministry? A ministry to the body of Christ. Now notice what he says. Then he calls us uh, uh, ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We talked about that not long ago. Seemed like on a Wednesday night. A house distributor, a manager, an overseer, an employee that's in that capacity, uh, a physical agent, a preacher of the gospel. The second thing he says is you don't own any of it. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his. We are just stewards of it. Now he says stewards of the mysteries of God, the glorious gospel and what God has chosen to reveal to us about himself. We heard a wonderful sermon this morning on our creator. Our creator God. Who blows us away with take almost any animal and study them. But what details we saw heard this morning, really, really, really good. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. He says, but not only stewards, but to be found faithful, trustworthy, trustful. He's getting us to think like Jesus. Now you think about this, the immediate context is divisions in the church. And Paul say, you're getting it all wrong. I'm not the captain. He's the captain. He's the one that, uh, now, let's go on. Because listen to, my second point is the proper evaluation of ministers. Look at verse 3. But with me is a very small thing, I should be judged of you. Uh, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then every man shall have praise of God. Two different words used here there's the term anacrino which means to scrutinize to investigate to uh, interrogate to determine and the second word is carino without the ana on it um, which means to distinguish to decide uh, it goes on and, and, and means to condemn To damn, to decree or determine, to go to the law, to sentence. So I want to reread that with a little bit in parentheses, is the way I wrote it in my notes, of the definition. But with me, it's a very small thing I should be evaluated of you. Or of man's judgment, evaluation by human authority. Yeah, I evaluate myself, not my own self. I don't even evaluate myself. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? In other words, that's not what makes me right before God. Your evaluation of me, my evaluation of myself. But he that evaluates and interrogates me is the Lord. Therefore, don't condemn Anything before the time until the Lord comes who will bring both to light the hidden things to dark and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then every man shall have praise. You know, as I I wrote this though, I thought, in other words, what I hear Paul saying, 
I don't care what you think of me. I, now, I do agree with this. If I get to caring more about what you think of me than what he thinks of me, I got a problem. And, and we're going to see later that sometimes that is not as easy a decision as we would think it would be. As a matter of fact, I've had to quit a job before. A laboratory that I was running and going, I can't work here anymore. I, I can't stand before my Lord tomorrow morning and keep doing what apparently has been happening. Um, but to some degree, I care what you think. I care that I, you, you, the, the reality is you are going to evaluate me. You're going to observe me. And what he had already told us is that you should be, when they observe you, found faithful, found trustworthy. Am I a good steward of God's word? Am I a good minister? Now, Ultimately, he doesn't care what you think or what anybody else thinks, even what he thinks, because we're not the judge. God's the judge. And one day, everything you've done, everything I've done, will be tested by fire. And God won't get any of it wrong. Not only our words, not only our actions, but even our motives, he will be tested. And it's all going to come out in the wash, is the way my mama used to put it. It's all going to be known. It's going to come to light. I will mention one very well-known passage, Matthew 7, 1 and 2. You know it. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. That is crino. That's that God stuff. God does that. Uh, you think about it in other passages. I can't judge you because apart from Jesus Christ, I'm lost. I can't judge myself. Oh, I need, I'm going to be judged. How could I judge you? But Jesus will judge us all. Now, I did find it interesting. He said, I don't even judge myself. And from a preacher point of view, I, it, it hit home. I can get up here and preach. And, and some of y'all will say, Boy, that was just a wonderful sermon. Now, some of you are lying. I, I know that. <laughs> But sometimes you'll say, and I can tell you're sincere, you'll say, man, that, that was just what I needed. And I can think that was the biggest zero. It was horrible. Forgive me, God, for, for not preparing more, better having illustrations or understanding your truth better than that. And then other times I think, baby, that one was out of the ballpark. And won't nobody say nothing to me. Because it's not about you. And it's not about me. It's about him. It's about his word. Um, so in this judgment that he's talking about, in, in these divisions and, and understanding, setting their mind right to view ministers properly, to view ministers the way Jesus views them, the way Jesus views you. You know, I used myself as an illustration on judge myself. But you know, I got to thinking that one of the greatest problems of a lost person, many lost people, let me put it that way, is a judgment of themselves. You can share their need for a savior. You can share the, the, uh, the, the penalty of sin is death. And I have had them say, I don't need a savior. I don't sin. And I used to go. <laughs> no, I make mistakes, they say. But I don't sin. Well, you're sinning right now. You're lying. <laughs> Secondly, let's just ask your wife or your kids if you sin. 
we all do. But what the problem is, they judge themselves wrongly. They're not thinking of themselves like Jesus thinks of them. And they think they don't need a Savior. Listen to me. If you don't know Jesus tonight, you are in dire need of a Savior. Because you are lost. And you are headed for a lake of fire for all eternity. But the Savior, if you'll receive him, and I think it's another important part of understanding and judging ourselves. I'm a child of the king. I'm not perfect, but I've been born again. I'm washed by the blood. He has empowered me and blessed me in every way that I need to do everything he has called me to do. Every way he's called me to minister to him, for him, and in his name, just like we heard this morning, to bring him glory and honor and praise. So, you know, a lot of people want to put chains on you. They want to, you know, I don't like the way, Brother Billy, you pick music for worship. So, you know, so what? I'm kind of like Brother Sam. If he keeps opening his mouth and that stuff keeps coming out, I, he can, he's wonderful. Or I don't like the way you preach or the illustrations you use. So? I've just committed to care more about what he thinks than what you think. Amen. You know, I, I hear it all the time. When, when visitors come and hear Brother Sam, they say, man, we don't hear that kind of preaching anymore. And I'm thinking, what are they preaching? You know, I, I don't think he's trying to be mean when he barks at us. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I had an old preacher, Brother Milton Gardner, tell me, you can tell people the toughest, hardest things as long as they know that, they, that you love them. The reason we can take all the barking and, the, and kind of leave, you know, with our toes all stepped up is because without a doubt our pastor loves us. Without a doubt. He cares more about what he thinks than what this whole world thinks about any subject, visions in church or anything else. But I do want to see that there are great freedoms as a minister. Uh, verse 67 says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and for Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think of men above what is written, that no one of you should be puffed up for one against another, who, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, then why would you glory in it? There's great freedom in, in Christ. We're not hindered by what men think. If, if, and we have great freedom here, great freedom to actually minister. But he, was, he says, uh, don't think of men, we're sinners, we're just forgiven. Amen? Amen. And, and the, it, it's a great turn off to lost people, for saved people to think they're something. There, there's a very clear uh, application here. Verses like the beggar lady that I made a joke about. I'm just another beggar who knows where to find a meal. Who knows where I can get warm. Who knows where I can take a shower or any of those things that many need. Uh, no pride. No humility. Uh, I have come to the pulpit with the Holy Spirit and I've come by myself. It ain't much fun by yourself. Um, but it is a ball with him. But, I, you know, they... they and, and there's a lot in this text. Uh, I want to get to application uh, because there is the real life of the minister. That's what he shares with him in, in the really the, almost the rest of the chapter. Listen to verse 8. Now you're full. Now you're rich. You've reigned as kings without us. 
And I would to God you did reign, that you might also reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God set forth us the apostles last, as we're appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle in the world, and angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're right wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. Even during this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and we're naked and buffeted, have no certain dwelling place. We're homeless and labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer, being defamed, we entreat, we made as the filth of the world. You see, what they've done and, and in their wrong thinking, and this really points back to the processional that would come in as the military, as the army returns from a great battle and they would be riding the white horses up front and the great victor. And then in the back were the chained uh, slaves from whoever they just defeated and, and they were in essence heading to death. He says, you've made yourself like you're up front. But God has really shown us that we're the ones in the back. And, and I, I've already said we're all ministers, but listen to that life that he just described as a minister of Christ. Fools for Christ. Weak, despised, hungry, thirsty, naked, buffeted, homeless, work with our hands, we're reviled, we're persecuted, we suffer, we're defamed, we're made as filth of the world. In verse 14, he says, I write this to warn you. Folks, I'll be honest with you, most of that as a minister in America, I have not faced. I haven't faced it. Occasionally, a, a somebody be ugly or something, but very, very rarely. But we here, you better be ready. We could see in our lifetime all those things happen. And Paul says, I warn you. I warn you. So truth to take away. Number one, have a godly attitude about yourself. If you're here and you're lost, you better understand you're lost. If you're here and don't have a Savior, you better understand you need a Savior. But if you are in Christ, understand who you are. Don't live beneath your plane. It's the way our pastor puts it so often. Don't live beneath your privilege. We need to understand God knows all your flaws. He knows all your failures. He knew him before he ever went into a relationship with you. And yet he still loves you. I don't understand it. I don't, I, I really, it's, it's hard to grasp. Now I can look at you and say, I understand how God could love you. The hard part comes with, I don't understand how he could love me. But he does. And he's called you. Not only does he love you, he's called you into his service. You're a minister. You're a servant. But you better understand you're not the master. You're the slave. Because it's not about you. Secondly, we need to have a godly attitude about other people. God loves them too. And he loves them and all their flaws and all their failures that drive us crazy. If, if Jesus loves them where they are it would seem we ought to love them where they were now I understand he doesn't leave them where they are and I don't think we ought to leave them where they are we ought to call them out of some of that he loves people now I understand too if I just visit with you one on one say I don't know you I am assuming you are lost until I hear testimony that tells me otherwise. If I'm going to make an error, I'm going on the side that I consider you lost and you need a Savior. I was at the Blue Store last week eating lunch. We call it the Circle of Wisdom. 
We've got one guy, if Google doesn't know, he calls him. I'm serious. And I've been witnessing to a guy, and somebody mentioned testimony. What's your testimony? And he was him hawing around and all over the place. And finally I said, here's what your testimony is. What was life like before Christ? What brought you to Christ? And what has life been like since you came to Christ? That's your testimony. That's my testimony. Sometimes that first part, what life was like, you know, I was on drugs and I was, I wasn't. I was a good kid. I made good grades. I didn't get in trouble. <laughs> Y'all find that hard to believe, don't you? <laughs> But there came a point I realized I wasn't good enough for heaven because you got to be perfect to go there. So we need a perfect Savior to pay the price. But what brought me to Christ was, was a, a, a faithful, evangelistic Methodist. No, no. Old school Methodists were firemen. They preached hard. And I said, ah, there's just something missing. He said, you need to get saved. So I knelt and came to Christ. My big story is what life's been like since. Amen. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly. But that, it, it, and it may be different. Paul's was that moment of coming to Christ. Christ on the Damascus road and a light blinded him and, and you go, wow, I don't have that. That's okay. It's your testimony, not Paul's. But understand, if you're here tonight and your testimony is I know Jesus as my Lord. And this young man ultimately shared a testimony with that I, I believe he is saved. God expects you to live like you belong to him. He expects you to live like a child of God. He expects you to be found faithful to what he's called you to. He expects you to be found trustworthy. Are you going to be perfect? No, you're not. But we have a perfect Savior. Thirdly, know the godly can be a difficult life. Serving Christ really is so much fun and, and so, so good. But don't be surprised when hardship comes. Don't think if hardship comes, then, then Christ must not love me or that Christ must be out of control or something. No, no. He's in full control. You, you just may need a little hot water to make the tea bag work better. We're kind of like tea bags, you know, Christians are. The hotter the water, the better we work. Sometimes it'll come from the outside. Sometimes it'll come from the inside. From the inside of the family of God. Sometimes maybe it's hard to do right to think right, to live right, to be honest and gentle and gr full of grace and mercy and love and joy and peace and patience and, and self-control. But as he lives in you, you can do it. Fourthly, and I'll close with this, never forget there's great freedom in Christ. There's freedom to live. Somebody that doesn't know Christ doesn't understand just how much bondage they're in. Real freedom, real freedom is found in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your precious word. We thank, for, thank you for how it's not just some philosophy or theology, even a deep book. It's right where we live. And Lord, you're just trying to get us to think like you do about ourselves, about other people, uh, about
that when hard times come or the freedom we have in you, you just want us to think like you. Oh God, would that be our heart's desire? To think like you. To make those right decisions based on your word in the midst of a many times very ungodly world. That someone might look at us and simply say, they are different. They are different. Lord, we love you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name I pray.